Mary Louise Chown, thank you so much for joining us from, are you near Winnipeg? I guess, yes, yes. Wonderful, in, in central Canada. And um, your topic is so interesting. And I know a lot of people have tuned in because of your topic. Um, shamanic elements in folk tales and, and fairy tales. So uh, please uh, introduce yourself fully, tell us about your work, and, uh, and please uh, lead us through a workshop on this uh, shamanic elements. Okay. Right. Um, I have a question for you. It hmm. looks like somebody's Mary asking Louise for a Oh, ju just a moment. Uh, listen, I'm going, to, I'm going to mute everybody. Uh, I didn't know about this woman until last week I researched her. Yeah, I'm muting all now. Mary, please unmute yourself. I'm, somebody's asking for admission. Someone's, uh, well, Did on my screen. In? Yeah, let her in. On my screen, okay. everyone has been admitted who's asking okay. for permission. But okay. if, if, it's, if you see something on your screen, go ahead. All right, all right. And okay, so, now so, so go ahead. The, the microphone and the stage is yours. Okie doke. I guess um, what I was curious to know with the ninety-minute workshops, Eric, do does it do you have a little break in between so people can go and pee or get a glass of water, or do just people leave as they need to? They just leave as they need to. Okay, then please do that, and I might have to do the same. You never know, but no, you can talk amongst yourselves then. Ha ha. But okay. I want to start with something that happened to my husband and I. Whoops. I just changed, somebody just changed my screen. Oh, I see. It's all right. I just answered my own question. We used to have a cottage on an island uh, in a lake not far from where we live now in the, I guess you'd say the Canadian Shield or the Boreal Forest. And in the morning early, we would take our cups of coffee and go down, it was a, quite a hike down to the water and sit on the dock and watch the sunrise. Well, one morning, it was around six in the morning, it was in the early summer, and we, we were walking off our little deck through some woods and a meadow down to the um, water. and. I looked around and everything glistened. The branches of the trees, all of the plants, the grasses, they were totally covered with spider's webs. And there must have been dew in the night because it was still early summer. And we could see every single spider's web. It was such a glorious view. It was as if we, we were walking through a completely different world. And I, I said to my husband, you know, I've never seen this before. And, and he agreed he hadn't. And we were, we had that cottage for 25 years and we sold it after we moved to the farm here. We've only had that experience probably twice. The the conditions were just right on those few occasions that we were conscious of all these spider webs that the sun had come out of a certain time and the angle of the sun and the dew, everything sparkled. And I remember saying to my husband, that's just like a shamanic world. Until you do some shamanic training, or, or practice like that with drum journeying, which I will explain in a minute. Most of us are not aware that other worlds exist. Well, we haven't been taught that way. There, why else? Why would we know? And there it is. It's there every morning. The spider's webs. We just can't see it. But we know, I know now, they're there all the time. And if I'm lucky and I'm there at the right time, I will see all those beautiful spider's webs. And I, I tell you that little anecdote just to illustrate the fact that things can exist and we don't really 
we've never learned, we've never been taught, our worldview uh, doesn't really uh, tell us that, that this sort of thing is possible. And, but uh, at that point I had been studying that type of spiritual practice, the drumming, and I had been telling stories for a long time. And so everything just kind of fell into place. And so remember that sometimes when you're wondering if there's something lurking or if there's another world, it's, it, it, it's possibly there. You just can't see it and you can't get to it at that point. And now perhaps as even if I said that, some of you have been reminded of stories, folk tales you tell or myths where uh, somebody's trying to get to another world and, and can't or manages to. So I'm sure it's gone click in your mind a little bit. Okay, so this is, I'm going a bit out on a limb with this workshop. I've never actually given it before, but I've been telling stories probably since the 70s in various locations and, there, and been learning more stories all the time as most of you know that happens. You just, your repertoire builds and builds and we're always so curious. And then I began to study the uh, practice of, sh of shamanic drumming and journeying and had a fair number of teachers, both local and international. And then I went back to school and took fine arts. Oh, I think I was 49 then. And started to hear about the archaeological digs and, and all the, um, the especially in the, the Celtic uh, world, the, the archaeological digs that had supported story details from stories from ancient texts. At any rate, all of this kind of started to work in, in me and I began to realize that some of the stories I've been telling, and it's probably happened to all of you, where there are details in the story that you go, oh, what's that all about? But you keep it in anyways. Maybe you don't understand what it's about, or maybe later on somebody comes and tells you what they think it is. But I, I would not leave something out of a story if I didn't understand it. I just would leave it in until it became clear. And it slowly became clear to me, I felt that a lot of our stories, our myths, our folk tales, our fairy tales, the old shamanic worldview was shining through. And I'm just going to admit somebody here. Perhaps in a, a reduced form, perhaps just a motif here and there in a story. A motif is like a recurring element. And you can probably recognize it, eh? The heroine on the white horse, the, 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 the devil or the wizard on the black horse. That's a, a motif. And, and he's chasing her and she's getting away. Just little little elements of stories, they, they call them motifs. Okay, so I began to realize that I felt that the elements of a worldview that existed probably in, well, Stone Age, Iron Age, Bronze Age, all of those um, prehistoric ages, and probably right even into the Middle Ages, these elements of that worldview lingered on. In fact, when my second child was born, my mother came and said to me, did you know that your son was born with a call? Now, I don't know how she knew that. Nobody told me. Uh, maybe, maybe she knew the nurse that had been attending. And, it was, and she said to me, Mary, if you're born with a call, that's a sign of good luck. Well, I'd never heard that before. Well, it's one of those signs from the old times, the old shamanic view times where uh, it was a sign. And I'd have to say in, in my son's case, good luck has traveled with him. He's in his 40s now. He's been in a lot of scrapes, but he's always come out. It seems like luck has just landed on his shoulders. And I've never forgotten that um, of my mom. Obviously that, has hung around into the, you know, the 20th century from a long time ago. So, so I started then to look purposely. And so that's what this workshop is going to be about. 
I hope to give you time to ask me questions or, or time to jot some things down if it appeals to you. But I thought I'd start by telling you two stories. They're each, one's very different from the other, but perhaps you will see some of the things that I'm trying to get at. Then we'll talk about, uh, no, hang on, I know. I think we'll talk about shamanism first, because if you're thinking, what am I supposed to look for in the stories? I, I don't know if some of you were at uh, Timothy Cope's session a couple of weeks ago, but he gave an excellent presentation on what, uh, what a shamanic practice is. And so I won't uh, go into that, except to say that it's an ancient spiritual practice um, from cultures the world over. It's, it's more like a world view as opposed to a set of dogmas or this is how we do things. It's the way that the world was viewed. And we assume that the, it existed in Europe at some point, as well as all over the world. There are still places in the world where people, uh, it's somebody else, uh, do practice shamanic techniques. These are not exactly the same all over the world. They're geographically uh, quite different. Most of the time though, the, it's a practice where a human being journeys to a, under an altered state of consciousness to other worlds, just as real as our own. But today we call it non-ordinary reality. And often it's accompanied by a rhythmic, monotonous sound like a drum or a rattle or a chanting or sometimes uh, drugs. It, it really depends on where you are. So there isn't any def definite sort of practice, but there are a lot of what they call cross-cultural similarities. And as I say, uh, Tim, Timothy Cope really uh, explained that well uh, for those of you who were at his presentation. Okay. There was the belief, just as my spider web story showed, there was a belief in other worlds and in the fact that spirits, animals, beings from other worlds, plants, trees, actually wanted to help us. And I was uh, at a talk a few years ago, um, a, a shaman from South America was visiting Winnipeg and he gave a talk through an interpreter. And he was extremely clear the fact that in his culture, uh, plants were used so that if, if a person came to see him and had a problem, he was attempting to say the very things I'm saying, that there are cross-cultural shamanic practices in the world even today. And it just seemed uh, like a word that could be used to describe that. But of course, no one actually uses that word to speak of. But for purposes of description, it's a very useful word. But it does imply an ecstatic one could be anybody. It's not a priest necessarily. It's not a doctor. It's not a healer. It's, it's maybe all of those things. So uh, it's a very open word. Okay, so what we have in, in these, this worldview that had shamanic practices was a journey, a journey to another reality to seek either information, help, oops, sorry, that was me, to retrieve a, a lost soul part, which I will go into later, to get any kind of information that would help either the community that that person was traveling and journeying for, or an actual individual, or the person themselves, the journeyer. Okay. And of course, there were always signs that you had managed to reach the other world. And of course, in the folk tales and the myths, those are places like, mostly if there's water, it could be a river, it could be a cave, it could be um, a mist that you go through. 
it, you could be climbing a tree or, or going deep into the earth. There's, it, there's a sense that you have gone to and, and arrived somewhere else. The other um, aspect of the, the shamanic practice or the shamanic world is the belief and the using of guides, animal guides, spirit guides, humans, plants, trees. And of course that implies that everything is in soul. Everything is alive. If they can give you messages and help you or hinder you, Everything is alive. That's another part. Okay. There's regalia. There's, uh, oh, lots of wearing of, oh, feathered cloaks, uh, hats that uh, with um, maybe antlers or, or bird-like hats, um, birch bark hats, just unusual clothing would be something else. And... Um, There's also the whole idea of the world tree. And in, in some cultures that still practice uh, shamanic healing and, and divination, they, there's a belief that the tree, the world tree, connects the earth, the sky, and everything in it. And of course, we all know there's many stories with the world tree in it. The Norse legends all have Yggdrasil, the tree that holds together of the whole nine worlds of the Norse mythology. So those are just some of the um, elements. Now this business of a lost soul, I would say that in the fairy tales and the myths, think of it as being under a spell or being enchanted. And the uh, heroine or the main character or the hero disenchants the person. And even today amongst even uh, psychologists, there's many words for it, but soul loss would be one where a part of a person just gets set aside and something has happened and in a traumatic way, it might not be terribly serious or it might be extremely serious, but a part of the person is no longer functioning properly. And um, in the shamanic journey, often uh, the, the shaman will go and search for that soul part and invite it to come back to the person. And as they say, think of that as in a fairy tale or a folk tale as enchantment and disenchantment. So we'll start with um, this first story that I'm going to tell you, and then we'll lay it open for some questions. There was an old woman with three daughters. And the oldest daughter said to the old woman, Mother, bake me a bannock and cut me a collop, which meant a piece of meat, ham or bacon. I'm off to seek my fortune. And the mother baked her a bannock, which is like a bun, flatbread, and cut her a collop, and she said, will you take it all without my blessing or half of it? But my blessing will then accompany you. And the first daughter, she said, well, there's very little enough as it is here. I'm going to need it all. I'll take my chances and go without your blessing. On a week or so later, the second daughter said, I want to go out and seek the world and, and, and find out what's out there. Will you Bake me a bannock and cut me a collop. And the mother did, and then she said, Will you take it all or, and go without my blessing, or take half of it and go with my blessing? Well, the same thing happened to her as happened to the older daughter. The older daughter was walking along, and she walked for most of the day, and she was hungry, and so she sat down at the edge of the road. This was a long time ago. There were no horses, no cars, no motels, nothing. And she opened up her meal and started to eat it when this old beggar woman approached her. Oh, can I have, can I have some of your meal, please? I'm so hungry. And 
the first daughter, she said to the old woman, there's little enough for me, I'm sorry, but I'm not sharing. And the old woman went away. Now later that day, the oldest daughter reached a house and it was dark and she thought, maybe I can spend the night there. And she knocked on the door and a woman answered the door and when she asked if she could spend the night, the woman said, you can do more. You can earn a shovel full of gold and a spade full of silver if you watch over the corpse of my young son in the other room all night. And the younger, the oldest daughter said, okay, I'll do that. So she was shown into the room and under the table lay the corpse of the young man. And there was a fireplace and the girl sat herself down and everybody else in the family went to bed. Round about midnight, the corpse sat up, looked at the girl and said, all alone, fair maid. She was so afraid she couldn't answer. She was tongue tied and the corpse rose and came towards her. All alone, fair maid. She still couldn't speak. It came right up to her. I asked you, all alone, fair maid. And when she didn't answer the third time, the corpse put out one finger, touched her on the shoulder and she turned into a flagstone by the hearth. And the same thing happened to the second daughter. She did not share her meal with the old woman on the road either. She said, there's little enough for me. And she too tried to spend the night at that house and was offered the job for a shovel full of gold, a spade full of silver. And she too agreed. And around about midnight, when the corpse woke up and asked her that question, she couldn't speak for the terror that was in her. And he touched her on the shoulder. And she turned into a flagstone on the hearth. Now the youngest daughter was the last one left and she thought, well, why shouldn't I go off and seek my fortune like my two older sisters? And maybe I will meet up with them. And so she said to her mother, bake me a bannock and cut me a collop. I'm off into the world to seek my fortune. And the mother did that and said, well, will you go with my blessing and only half of the meal or will you go without my blessing? Oh, mother, she said, I can't go anywhere without your blessing. And so she took half of the collop and half of the, of the bagel and she set off, or not the bagel, the, the um, bannock, and she set off and she too, when she stopped partway through the day to eat, was approached by the old beggar woman. Oh, she said, you poor old thing. And she broke her meal in half and shared it with the beggar woman. And the old woman said to her, thank you. When you need help, I will help you. And the girl smiled at her politely, but she thought to herself, what possible help could she give me? And she went on her way and she came to that same house that her two older sisters had reached at the end of the day and knocked on the door and asked if she could stay the night and was offered the job of watching over the corpse of the young son for a shovel full of gold and a spade full of silver. And she was shown into the room and there was the fire burning. There was a bowl of, of apples on the table and a bowl of nuts and under the table lay the corpse and the rest of the family went to bed. And she sat there and she munched on the apples and she cracked open the nuts. And the time went by and she looked down at the corpse and she thought to herself, what a pity, such a handsome young man and lying there dead, what a waste. Round about midnight, the corpse sat up and looked at her, all alone, fair maid? Why, she said, no, I'm not alone. There's a dog and a cat sleeping on, by the fire. I've got a bowl of apples and a bowl of nuts. All alone, I'm not. The corpse rose up and walked towards her. You're not afraid? No, she said, why should I be afraid? 
you're dead, I'm alive. Well, you can't come where I have to go tonight. Oh, yes, I can. I undertook to watch over you. I have a job to do. You cannot follow me. I must go through the quaking bog, the burning forest, the pit of terror. I must climb the glass mountain and I must dive into the Dead Sea. And with that, he went out the window. Well, she scrambled and she followed after him and caught up with them. And they walked until they came to a green hill. And the corpse said, open, open green hill and let the light of the green hill out and let me in. And she had enough wit to say, and the maid that's behind him. And the green hill opened and in they walked into a world that looked the same as hers, but not the same. And right away, there was the bog, quaking with quicksand and, and oozing. And there was just sort of little hillocks that a person could leap from so they wouldn't sink into the quicksand. And there was the corpse striding across the quaking bog. And she stopped at the edge of it, wondering what to do, when a, a woman ran out and appeared beside her. Looked like the old woman from the road, but dressed very differently. And she touched her feet and her shoes grew to be over a foot around. So she was able to walk from one hillock to the next and follow the corpse through the quaking bog. As soon as they were through that, she saw him disappear into the flaming forest and she hesitated once more, but that same woman came and threw a cloak over her that was soaking wet and covered her face and her hair and, and her body. And she followed through the flaming forest and not a hair on her head was singed. Just in time to see him going across the pit of terrors and she heard the screams of the animals and the growls and the slithering of the snakes. But that woman came again and put wax in her ears so that she couldn't hear a thing. And she followed him across the pit of terrors. And then she saw him going straight up a mountain whose side was sheer glass. What could she do? She hesitated again. And that same woman came, touched her shoes with her magic wand, and the bottoms of her shoes were all sticky. So she was able to climb up the glass mountain after the corpse. And when she reached the top, he was sitting there, looking down the other side. A quarter of a mile down was the Dead Sea. He turned to her and he said, go home. You've done well to follow me this far. Go and tell my mother how far you've come. No, she said, I'm staying with you. I undertook to watch you. I have to dive into the Dead Sea. You can't follow me. And down he went and she after him without giving it a thought. Her breath was taken away from her. She was stupefied and she hit the water and down, down, down they sank and down into this green world. And below, well, she found she could breathe and, and she was in a world of a green meadow with flowers. And the corpse was sitting there and she went and sat beside him and she was so exhausted. She fell asleep with her head on his shoulder. When she awoke, she was back in that house where the corpse had lain. And she was lying in a bed and beside the bed stood the mum and the corpse, only he wasn't a corpse anymore. He was alive. Oh, and they thanked her. They said that an evil witch had put a spell on him. She wished to marry him and make him her own and he refused. And the spell she put on him was he was to lay between life and death until some girl, some woman could come along and do everything he had to do in that one night. 
what could they do for her? And she said, do you know of what happened to my sisters? Yes. And they touched the flagstones and the two sisters came back to life. Now they went home and what their lives were like, the story does not say. It says that the youngest daughter married the corpse now alive and lived contentedly and may all who hear this story also live a life of contentment. Now, okay. That's a story from Ireland. And okay, let's look at that for a minute before I tell you the next story. It's a folk tale. Now, you might say, for I'm not a folklorist, so uh, and I haven't studied the folklore like a folklorist, but it, I could say that myths, folk tales, fairy tales, legends, they all sort of come under the heading of folk narratives. And um, so we, let's not worry about whether it's a fairy tale or a folk tale, but it's a story that's come down to us. Uh, and around in the 1800s, a lot of these stories were written down. There was the Romantic era, and many countries wrote down their stories. And, and the Irish um, has a huge, huge archive going back to probably the 4th or 5th century AD. So the stories have been around for a long time. So we won't get into that, I just because I want to talk about the shamanic elements. But that uh, folklore is a whole other study. Now... In this story of the corpse watchers, what I didn't mention about shamanic journeys is the person doing the journeying journeys with an intent. This doesn't go off kind of wandering around going, oh, what am I going to find today? Journeys with intent. And that story, the corpse watchers, in, in my feeling, the two older sisters came to harm, or at least their wishes, their desires weren't met because they did not leave with the right intention. Whereas the younger daughter, we know everything's going to be okay with her. It's a folk tale because she goes with her mother's blessing. So you might say that's a metaphor for journeying with an intention. And then of course, everything that happens to her she has she seems to know what to do whereas the two older daughters they they didn't share their food they were terrified of the corpse they they just didn't get anywhere so that's one of the signs that the the person who does a, sh a shaman is trained uh and depending on the uh, culture maybe for a long, long time, or maybe for a short time. It really varies worldwide. There's no set rule. So we've got that. Then we have, she's in, still in the ordinary world with this corpse, but it starts to change, doesn't it, when the corpse talks to her and suddenly leaves and she follows. She knows she's supposed to follow. She's not afraid. And then that green hill opens and they're in another world. So in this story, it has those elements of the bog and the flaming forest and the pit of terrors and the glass mountain. You probably come across other stories with a glass mountain in it. These are, are very familiar things. But then to find out in the end that he has been under a spell. And so in a sense, it's like a metaphor for a soul retrieval because he can't function. He's between life and death. He can't go on with his life until he's disenchanted or until the spell is broken. And so in a sense, that is like the, the soul retrieval that a shamanic person would do. Okay, so here's another story. And this is from a friend of mine who traveled to Russia and to the 
former Soviet Socialist Republics, all the way to Chukotka, which is the very eastern part of Russia uh, by the Bering Sea. And she, she could speak Russian, and it's a long story as to why she went there, but she came back having heard a lot of stories. And this one comes from the area around Chukotka, which is on the far, far east. Okay. Old woman Kitna lived in the Koryak village of Kishiga. And one day, the villagers noticed there was a pack of wolves, 28 wolves, just outside their village, and they were a little unnerved by that. There was also a blizzard, because they were out on the tundra. Now, Kitna lived with her husband and her daughter, Ralinavut. One day, just after the blizzard had come and gone, Ralinavut went for a walk out on the tundra, but she didn't return. And though they searched for her everywhere, all the villagers, they finally said to her mother, Kitna, that she had likely become lost in the storm and frozen to death and the snow had covered her and there was nothing you could do. Only Kitna refused to believe that her daughter was dead. Well, three years passed and Kitna would not give up the hope that her daughter was still alive she was the only one as well who had remembered that when Rali Navu disappeared, there was that wolf pack of 28 wolves and they had also gone. So one night she said to her husband, I'm going to go looking for Rali Navu. She took her shaman's drum and she began to play her drum and to sing all night long she played the drum and sang and searched. And in the morning she said to her husband, I know where Rali Navut is. The wolves have taken her and they've gone up north to Talkap. I'm going to go and get her and bring her home. Wife, he said, Talkap, it's so far north. How it's too far for you to go on foot. I know how to get there and I'm going to go. Will you help me prepare? And he did. They spent the day making the preparations and early the following morning, first light, she set off. She had gone only a hundred paces from her village when she took on the form of a wolf and began to race across the tundra. And presently she came across a nomad camp of reindeer herders and she took on her woman's form and she walked into the camp and, and they looked at this, her old woman, and they said, old woman, where have you come from? On foot like that. And she told them she was Kitna from Kashiga and she was going up north to Talkap to look for her daughter Ralinavut. Well, take one of our reindeer can't walk all that way. Well, she said, that's all right. I know how to travel. And when she left them, after she'd gone a hundred paces from their camp, they saw her change into the shape of a wolf and continue racing north. And they said, ah, oh, that's why she didn't want one of our reindeer. And along the way, she met another wolf who was coming south. And they spent some time together there in the tundra. And she said to him, brother, is there a pack of wolves still up at Talkop? 28 wolves? Oh yes, he said, actually there's 29 wolves and they are there near Talkop. 29 wolves, well then that must be where daughter Ralinavut is. And they said goodbye and she sped off in her wolf form until she reached a Chukchi village. And she took on her woman's form and walked into the village 
and they too were surprised to see her and as my friend discovered when she visited they love having visitors and they give you the best meat in the warmest place by the fire where are you going old woman on foot where have you come from they said to her and she told them i'm kitna from the koryak village of kachiga i'm going to bring my daughter rali at home tell me is there a pack of 29 wolves up near talkap by you oh yes oh yes said the chukchi people they've been bothering our reindeer there's 29 wolves there and they're not leaving very good tomorrow morning i will go and seek them out and bring my daughter home and she walked out of the village but after a hundred paces took on her wolf form and she reached the pack of wolves and they were all eating on a reindeer and she circled them and she called out as she circled here are wolves among them is Ralinavut. now the wolf called Ralinavut felt the hairs on the back of her neck stand up and prickle who could be calling my name out here in the tundra but she didn't move Keetna circled a second time around the wolf pack these wolves are thieves they have stolen my daughter Rali Navut. the wolf called Rali Navut. oh my mother it's my mother out there I can't go to her I've I've been with the wolves for too long and she didn't move. And Keetna circled a third time. Ralinavut, she sang out. You have a human name. You are human like me. And Ralinavut could not restrain herself. She quietly and quickly left the pack feeding on the reindeer. And she went to where her mother in the wolf form was and she said, Mother, why have you come? I, I can't come home with you. I've, I've been with the wolves for too long. Now, Rali Navut, said Keetna, listen to me. I've come a long way to get you, and I'm not going home without you. Now, there's a Chukchi village not far from here. We can go there, and we can rest before we journey back home. And the wolf called Rali Navut agreed. And they set off quietly and quickly from the pack but when they reached the Chukchi village, they took on their woman's forms and walked into the village. And the Chukchi, oh, what a woman, that Kitna. She's brought her daughter Rali Navut from the wolf pack. And they feasted them and, and the two women stayed there for several days and recovered their energy and rested. And then one morning Kitna said, we have to go home now. Let us take you on our reindeer, said the Chukchis. Oh no, we have our own way of traveling, said Keetna, but thank you. And off they walked. But when they had gone a hundred paces from the village, they took on their wolf forms and raced south across the tundra. Ah, oh, said the Chukchi, no wonder they didn't want our reindeer. Wolves are much faster. Now in Kashiga, the villagers looked out that day and they saw two wolves approaching and they were, they were frightened and they, they called out to everybody, there's wolves coming right into the village. Well, Keetna's husband said, it can't possibly be, wolves just don't come right into a village, it must be Rali Navud and Keetna. Look again and when they all looked again, yes, two women walking side by side into the village. It was Kitna and Varali Navut, and they had brought themselves safely home. Now I have uh, a storyteller, Kira Van Dusen, to thank for that story. She was the friend of mine who traveled to Russia uh, and could speak Russian, so could translate. And I think she has published it in one of her books. She has a pile of books out. At any rate, um, 
it's a different story from the Corpse Watchers. It's not really a folktale, but let's look at what the elements are of a shamanic journey. For starters, let me ask all of you, you may be mostly at home. Uh, are you at home in your own living rooms? Um, okay, if you're home in your own living room, without getting up, can you cast your mind into your kitchen and into open your fridge door in your mind's eye and see what's in your fridge? See if you can do that. If that's presuming you have a fridge, you might be in a hot country or you might be in a cold country and you don't need a fridge. But at any rate, a food cupboard if you don't have a fridge, what's in there? Don't leave, go in your mind's eye. Remember from the last time you looked. Open the door of the fridge or the cupboard and look inside. Were most of you successful in looking inside your fridge? Right, yeah. So that's a journey that you took in a sense. You, you cast your mind to a place you've already been. The only difference would be in, in, in many shamanic journeys, the shaman will travel back to the same locations, but also to new, the spirit animals or the guides will often take the shaman to a new place where they haven't been before. But you can see how your body can stay in one spot, but your mind can travel. And so Keetna stayed in her house but beat her drum, and her intention was to find her daughter. And she was able to locate her. Then she could, in her own physical, pardon me, reality, travel. Now, the other thing that shamans can do on their shamanic journey is shapeshift. Now, we could say, well, can they do that in real life? Probably not. But the worldview that the shamanic practices come from is a, a world that very few people in it and an awful lot of animals and an awful lot of forests and an awful lot of places that have not been explored. And so it might be a lot easier to imagine that, well, I don't know if you've done this, but we have a great horned owl that comes and calls in the trees. And when I hear it, I go out on the deck of my farmhouse and I return its call and, and think that I'm, I'm talking to it. So it's not that unusual for a, a person to feel they can shape shift and become something else. But definitely in a journey to the other world, you can. Now, all of us, I'm sure, especially as children, have imagined we could be something else. So it's, it's not a big stretch. So here we are, there's Keetna, and uh, she can be a wolf because she can travel quicker. So the rest of the story, um, I really am quite fond of that story because of, of her bringing her daughter home and not taking no for an answer. Um, whenever, as a shamanic practitioner, I have participated in what might be called soul retrieval and someone has asked me, so I've gone and I've usually found a, a part of, of the, um, the lost part of, the, of that person that's stopping them from moving on. And it's quite often, or pretty much always, a younger version of themselves. And on the drum journey that I would take along with my helper, I would have to um, convince this person to come and saying things like, well, you know, you've got a really good sense of humor and um, my client needs that. Uh, and you'll be safe with me. You know, you can ride on my animal, my power animal, or usually I've never had an occasion where this lost soul part refuses to come. So in a sense, that's what Keaton is doing. She's saying, Ralinavut, you're human. You know, you can come home with me. 
you don't have to remain a wolf. So that's where I'm seeing that these stories, some of them are actually describing a shamanic journey, but most of them are describing parts or telling about. And to me, I feel that the stories when they were first told, the, everybody was familiar with that world and familiar, just like right now, most of us that have grown up, we had to learn the Greek myths in school. Um, if you have any kind of, uh, if you're Islamic, you know the Quran. Uh, if you're in, in India, you probably know the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And, and uh, in the Christianized world, the Bible. And these, um, these are everywhere. You know, somebody just says Moses and everybody knows Moses if they've read the Bible. So it was a world that people knew what was going on. They knew people did this. And so these stories made complete sense to them. Even though for us, they might go, what? She became a wolf? What do you mean? What do you mean she, she just sat in her house and drummed and she knew where her daughter was? So that's why I feel that, um, that these shamanic elements have stayed. And now there's many theories the, oh, if I think if I can remember her name, Heidi Abendroth. She's got another na middle name in there, Gutner Abendroth. She has looked at uh, fairy tales and folk tales and um, the whole idea of the goddesses and gods uh, still remaining in the fairy tales and the folk tales, but being now called heroines or devils or angels or uh, so that they could appeal to the actual... Um, audience of the time. So she would be an interesting person to look up. But right now, I just want to say one thing about this altered state of consciousness. When I said, go and look inside your fridge, I didn't, we didn't do anything to help you get there, but you were still able to do it. But if you were going to um, do something where you weren't sure you were a shamanic practitioner, and you were looking for some information from the spirit world, you would want a guide. And I found, in my case, the drumbeat. Um, many uh, of the cultures that use the drumbeat call it the, the horse that carries them. And the drumbeat, I've looked them up so that, for those of you who would wish to know, it's so many beats per second and what it does, we have various different brain waves. There's, I've got a list here. There's beta, there's alpha, there's theta, there's delta. They're all a, a brain wave at a certain frequency. The, um, the theta brain wave is a, it's slow. And it's like, a, it's described as here, wakefulness, and relaxation, but also used in meditation or appearing in meditation or solving mathematical tasks. <laughs> but this is what it sounds like. Um, this is just a Remo drum because my real drum sounds terrible on the internet, but this is about the speed and it's very monotonous, but you learn. I mean, when I play it for you, some of you might go, oh, that doesn't do anything for me. And don't worry about it. it I just want to give you a sense of the speed with which it goes and how you do learn that you can get your brain into the theta waves where you can actually go into a trance. See, it's a very fast drum beat, which, believe it or not, works. 
Now, in other cultures, there's psychotropic drugs, there's chants, there's rattling, but uh, this is the one I'm familiar with, so that's why I can demonstrate it to you. And sometimes it takes practice, but any kind of shamanic work takes in practice and dedication, and most people I know don't do it full time. Um, it, in my case, it's just word of mouth uh, if somebody asks for help. Anyways, let's back to the stories. But that's the idea. Is, is, is that's probably what she was doing? Is is that just that steady, steady beat? I've gotten to the where I can be sitting somewhere and just tapping my thigh at the same rate if I need to. Uh, for some reason want to go into a trance. You do learn and then it becomes easier. But, you know, very few people really, really want to learn that. I guess what I'm interested in is the whole world view that produced shamanism because I think it has uh, benefits for us today. But I'm going to stop for a minute and not going any further until I find out whether there's some questions that need answering really badly. Oh, I see Faye is here. Hi, Faye. I don't know you, but I heard of you and I have one of your books. Yeah, she knows Kira as well. Okay, um, anybody want to raise their hand here? Well, the name of the woman, Heidi. What was the name, Heidi? Gutner, like G-O-E-T-T-N-E-R. And then the third name is... Abendroth, A-B-E-N-D-R-O-T-H. She's in Germany. Could, could you respell the names, please, Mary? Um, Heidi, uh, then good. Why don't you like, put them in the chat? Oh, yeah, that would be good. Oh, golly. You know, I'm terrible at doing two things at once, but okay. Well, let me talk for a minute while you do that, Mary. Okay, okay. Um, so th there are a number of people here uh, who, who have a good deal of experience with, with shamanism and folk narratives. Timothy, thank you for being here. Christopher, thank you for being here, and I'm sure others. Uh, of the two wonderful stories Mary has told, uh, did, have any thoughts come to mind regarding how shamanic elements appear in these stories? Timothy, Chris, or anyone else? Well, um, if, if you're familiar with the shamanic worldview, um, to my mind, those elements are, are really um, very apparent. Um, I unfortunately missed most of the second story because I got a phone call that I needed to attend to. But um, for the first story, um, it was just thrilling. Uh, to see the um, to see the soul retrieval elements in that story and and to see uh, how um, the young the young girl had had her purpose had her purpose which was okay I need I need to watch over I need to care for um, the corpse of this young man. And so she had that clear intention, which then carried her forward into, into the non-ordinary reality um, and successfully brought him back to life, in essence. Uh, and that, that, that is a wonderful um, folk version of a soul retrieval. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of you here, I'm sure, are familiar with the myth of uh, um, Orpheus and Eurydice, and uh, that's that's a version of a soul retrieval that doesn't turn out so well, because uh, Orpheus is not able to keep to keep to his instructions and therefore keep to his intention of don't look back, just go forward. As I've mentioned uh, over the over these weeks, uh, many fairy tales and other traditional stories uh, came into being in Europe, Scandinavia, the Slavic countries after 
the after the implement, implementation of monotheism, after the, the implementation of, of Christianity, especially. So the stories about the ancient gods and goddesses and the um, and the shape shifting and the um, these non ordinary realities. Uh, in a very spontaneous, non-organized way, were recycled into, into fairy tales and other folk narratives in a way that they were not in competition with the religion now. Because if you were in competition with the religion, you'd be killed. You'd be called very a wise. demon worshiper. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, in a sort of innocent way, they, these stories reappeared in these seemingly innocuous stories which we don't take seriously because we know they're not true, but they have a very strong mythic under undertext. Yes. Yeah, even um, I have lots of connection to Denmark and Iceland, but especially Denmark. And there at Christmas, you, you put um, a pat of butter in your rice porridge and you always bring a bowl of rice porridge up to the attic with your children to feed the Nisa. And um, I've read that the butter is really symbolic of the sun. You know, it's part of that sun worship that, that yeah, got um, sterilized. So I love that part. Yeah, I'd love to just jump in here. Uh, no, uh, thank you so much, Mary. This is, uh, I, I don't actually don't know that much, <laughs> but I am fascinated by this whole point of view and the whole worldview. Um, uh, and one thing I understand about mythologically, there's always multiple levels happening, happening simultaneously, multiple mm -hmm. levels happening sim simultaneously. So there would be the psychological, there would be the sociological, it, there would be what I would call the environmental, uh, there would be a, a spiritual, all these different levels happening simultaneously. Um, and I love, uh, uh, you know, the, what I've heard is, you know, if you're going to shoot an arrow, if you're going to shoot an arrow, you got to be very clear what you're aiming for, because that arrow, once loosened, will find a target. And if you haven't, don't have a clear healing intention, it could, it'll find some target, and it could do destruction. Um, and then um, uh, uh, one more thing: uh, there's this amazing poet Umberto Acabal, and he passed away about a year ago. Uh, but he's a Guatemalan poet uh, from the indigenous world, and uh, I was at a uh, talking with him once, and he said uh, um, that that whole world of magical realism, you know, the the uh, the novels that were, he said that is the shamanic world. <laughs> so I just point that out. Thank you. Um, yeah, my friend uh, Akira, when she traveled, it, the Soviet Socialist Republics were no longer SSRs. And she found, she has a wonderful story from Tuva. Maybe I can tell you that if there's time. Um, she found in, in some of the smaller outposts in what we kind of call Siberia, but it's really not, I, I'm being very generalized there. There's a lot of small little countries and, and areas. Uh, there were uh, existences of clinics where you would have a regular Western medicine doctor but you would also have a shamanic practitioner. And uh, she was quite heartened to see that happening uh, side by side. And I just wanted to point out that the, yeah, the, all the levels of myth that you just described, was it Christopher, yeah. They're also in the folk tales, but there's so much metaphor. Then metaphor to me has, very what I call thick meaning. If I said golden eagle, all of a sudden to all of you, or um, waterfall, uh, or uh, sunrise, you, 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 right away you've made a wonderful image of something, something that connects you with that metaphor. So it's a very thick, it's, in fact, I've been told by my Buddhist teacher that Images are deeper than words. And so I think the value, one of the values of shamanic practice today, and Timothy, you know, join, jump in there, is when I've journeyed for somebody, I've brought back something sometimes I have no clue 
what this is. I remember bringing back red shoes. And, and, and when I came back from my journey, I said, well, the spirits gave me this pair of red shoes to give you. Well, I didn't have red shoes, but I had the metaphor. And she right away knew exactly why she needed those red shoes and was able to tell me. And so I think the world of metaphor, we've, we need that so badly today to give us um, deeper reasons and meanings and use our imagination more than... Um, then we're doing that in, 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 our, in today's world. I, I don't know if you've been following the Canadian news, but we've been having a hell of a time here with our uh, extreme right convoys taking over our capital city and spouting inane you know, freedom. They haven't a clue what they're talking about in many cases. They are free, sort of. But at any rate, the you know, metaphor is an imagination I just wanted to throw that in, that we, we need it today. Anybody yeah. else? If I can just briefly jump in here, I see people have their hands up. Um, in, our, in our world today, we have been taught, drilled into us, that if something is imaginary, it is bogus. It, it can mm -hmm. be discounted. And, and that's, that's really just the opposite of the spiritual worldview where the imagination is a doorway into non-ordinary reality, is a doorway into the numinous. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Louise, then Denise. Um, yes, uh, thank you for those um, beautiful stories. Um, I, I noticed that in the first story, the daughters um, the daughter who was kind was the one who ended up um, getting the help. And uh, um, in a lot of folk tales and fairy tales uh, from all over the world, um, they're about the power of love and kindness. And I'm wondering um, if you would be willing to talk a little bit about that, uh, Mary Louise. I guess what comes to mind in response would be, for starters, you're right, that, that occurs so often. In fact, sometimes if I've ever if I've told stories in, in schools, I can the odd student when I go, the oldest sister did this and the second sister or the third brother, I can almost hear them going, oh, it's one of those stories again. You know, the youngest one's gonna succeed. And, and it's almost like, oh, ho-hum, boring. Um, and, and for a while, I, with the Mother Holly story, I was like that, and I don't like that story. The oldest one, you know, is it, it's just too familiar. And, but now that I look at them differently, you're right. They, that deeper meaning is the, the kindness and compassion and the, the, the right living, the right intention for your actions uh, that are always in some way going to come back tenfold on you. And often these stories have been so simplified that that deeper meaning is gone and people just go, oh yeah, I'm on one of those stories again. Somebody else was waiting to talk. Yes, Denise, then Judy. Okay. Um, Mary, thank you so much for sharing this. When you spoke of retrieving the soul, the first thing that came to mind with that is that with all of the mental illness that is in the world, with all of the lack of direction that motivates one to really want to do something and see it transpire, all of these things, all of the noise that we have today in this world from misinformation purposefully being disseminated across the board, the, dis the dissension and the tension between different people, the lack of religion. And I say that in the way of a loss of a tradi traditional practices, um, where if you belong to a certain sect or community religious organization and every, you know, this day, you're, everyone does this, and at this time of day, everyone does that. 
where you have these guideposts that say, you know what, if you fall within here and you're doing what you're supposed to, it, it edifies you and says, okay, you're a good person because you have something to measure that with. Um, I don't know where everyone else is, but I live in this little tiny city and we have seven different churches within a three block radius um, of different denominations and different different belief structures and all of them have seen such a drop in membership and community gatherings um, as far as structured religious practices go um, and then there's also unitarian universalist universalist unitarians <laughs> are you use which is wonderful which kind of pushed that away but come together to have that community connection. And all of these, this, this confusion and all of the sound and, and all of this lack of direction, because it's not just the journey and, and everyone here knows that it's having a destination. If you don't have a destination that you're striving to get to, you never meet obstacles and you never exert your power to overcome them or to learn your lessons through them. So there has to be something, even if it changes. But all of this stuff and with the practice of the drum beat or the music, I have a singing drum and in the morning I play it and I leave with the highest tone. It just cuts through the noise around me. We need that just to focus and draw back. And honestly, I feel so sad for the world and for everyone because we're all suffering through this. But at the same time, we have people like Mary, people who are teaching about mindfulness, people who are teaching about starting personal ritual, people who are talking about, you know, looking at actions and stories and believing and, and receiving as believing and positives and all of those things. And it's almost like there is this, this electric ether world of, of combat going on, pulling us one way to the other. I know I just went on a rant. I love stories for the metaphor that is in them um, to look at them differently for how, you know, each of the characters are there. Um, but I just want to say, Mary, thank you so much. And I'm going to stop now because if I don't stop, I won't. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Right. Okay, just two things to comment on that is one, yes, intention for the journey, but I would caution that doesn't mean that in order to succeed, we have to know exactly what we're doing all the time and have a plan for our life down, nailed down to the last minute. So it's not that kind of intention. There's a difference. And the other point I want to make that you helped bring out um, was the fact that in, in the shamanic worldview, there's a lot of uncertainty, but you're, you're, you travel with courage and, and um, knowing that you will have find help. And un, we don't seem today to be able to live with uncertainty very well. And it makes us far less resilient to things that are happening that we don't have any control over. So I think the resilience and the ability to live with uncertainty that perhaps the shamanic worldview had going for it are two things we could use more of today. That's all that I want to say. Yeah. Good. Judy, then Janet. Judy, you're on mute. I'd like to thank you because um, I had like a little epiphany about why it's because it used to, I always wondered why is it the youngest, right? Why is it the youngest? And I had an epiphany based on what you said, because I realized that the oldest has been the most indoctrinated, has been most conditioned. And that when you get to the younger person, they're, they've been having the leadership, you know, all these people telling them whatever, but they sort of are in a way humbled or beaten down a little bit by their older siblings. And by being, you know, the last, there's there's more of a place of movement because you're 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 new to the world or newer to the world. I, so I, I didn't have that before. So I thank you for that. 
And um, the, the shamanic, the thing that I liked was that this idea that when we imagine image making, which shamanic is these symbols, it allows us to individually interpret for ourselves our inner truth if we take the time to be with it. And that's the gift of the symbolism and the metaphors is that they don't have to be interpreted by you. I mean, yes, it's helpful if somebody says, well, this is generally what this means, right? You know, like um, the red shoes, but that woman who had the red shoes given to her, she made it what it meant to her, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the gift because it's not laid out for people and it's more vague, which allows you to make it more you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one last point on that before we move to the next person. Is it possible if we're talking metaphor that the two siblings or the three siblings, whether they're brothers or sisters, could actually also refer to one person? So the first older sister has a go at it, doesn't work. Second one, maybe it's the one person going, I didn't work that time. Oh, well, what was the matter? Oh, it didn't work that time. Oh, this time I'm going to do this. So it could also be one person that they're talking about rather than three. But right. Different, but also three. different versions of yourself, different versions of yourself. In other words, your approach at one point might get you so far, but it's not yeah. until you adapt and change that you yeah. can get the full impact. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we're so wise. <laughs> Somebody else was waiting. Janet. Well, actually, what has just been said is part of what I was going to say, that in my own experience, I feel it's the inner child who is the truth of myself. And going through different um, stages in my life, until the inner child gets healed, that truth isn't revealed. I don't truly know the essence of me. The other thing that I wanted to share is, Mary, when you were telling that last story, I loved how Kita's voice is so grounding, because it's one thing to explore other worlds, but we also have to bring that information back and ground it so that we can utilize it in this world. So um, I loved how Kita's voice was. Um, so um, clearly defined that aspect hmm. because it grounded me when I heard her. It brought me back to this moment. Mm -hmm. So um, I, those are the things I wanted to share. And thank you. Those were amazing stories. Okay. There was someone else waiting to speak. No? Okay. How are we for time, Eric? We're okay. Uh, Jeff, did you want to say something? Your hand is up. Yeah. Um, I think that a lot of times when doing shamanistic practice, we over, we don't, emphasize enough that a lot of times what we are is actually a catalyst. We don't necessarily know what the information or who we need to bring together. We just are the point that does. Now, I operate out of the Bardic tradition, so I was taught that I need to maintain a foot in both worlds, both this world and the other world. And I find that in many cases, when you tell the old traditional stories, that in and of itself is a, is a shameless journey. Mm -hmm. When I take my audience with me into the story, and I'm sure other storytellers do the same thing, that's a shamanistic journey in of itself. Mm -hmm. It's true. Um, I had an experience in a, a school classroom. There was um, some grade ones and some grade sixes, and I was telling the story of the seal skin, which is uh, from Scotland and Iceland and, and northern Canada. And um, 
one of the of the grade six put up his hand afterwards and said, "Well, how did how did you know um, that this that this really happened?" And and little grade one, she put up her hand. She said, "I know, I know, I know, I know." So I thought, "Well, I'll let her answer the question." And she said, she turned around to the grade sixer and she said, "Well, she was there." And so obviously she thought I, as a storyteller, had been to where this story took place. So you're right. She thought I had been on that journey and I'd taken that class on that journey to that where the seal skin is stolen and she dives back into the sea when she finds it. And we were nowhere near the sea, you know, we're in the middle of the continent. So I agree completely. We, as storytellers, not every teller, not every story, it's again, what's, what your intention is and, and the gift you're giving. And you, people do say, you, you've taken them on a journey. Yeah, you're right on there. I think oftentimes we don't necessarily know the effect we have. No. Uh, I was doing a festival one time in a little schoolhouse and it was raining and a bunch of middle school kids came in. I hate middle school. <laughs> grade schoolers, grade schoolers love everything you tell them. High schoolers are just glad to be out of class. Middle schoolers haven't arrived yet. They're not cool, so they try too hard. But these kids came in and I was telling some traditional fairy tales and they left. And they came back later and I had told them that I had heard stories that there were fairy rings in the woods that are around this little historical village we were doing the festival in. And they came back and said, we found them. We saw them. They're real. I, to this day, have no idea what they saw in the woods. But that group of middle schoolers formed a storytelling group and went into grade schools and taught fairy tales to the little kids. Wow. So you never know what the effect of, of our tales have no. and where we've taken that audience. Uh, Regina, uh, and then we, we need to move on to your workshop, but go ahead, Regina. I just want to say, <laughs> um, I love middle school uh, because um, as soon as they figure out that you don't hate them because they are middle schoolers, they're wonderful. They're hungry. They're really hungry. So, you know, I, I love your story about, you know, and they ran out and they found it, you know, because they were listening. They just had to pretend they weren't, you know, and then they went, oh, whoa. So that was a great story. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Faye, did you want to say something? Oh, I was just going to say that I, I think when I'm telling a story well, that I'm actually in the, like, there's the there's myself there's the audience and then there's this place in between and and you know perhaps that is kind of a shamanic experience because i mean i don't really know how i get there as i'm telling the story but when i'm there i just i'm there and and the story is so alive for me and uh, i have a lot of fun <laughs> great well uh, mary louise chown chown i want to thank you so much for leading this session and opening things up you know we we have a, a, a lot more questions than we have answers, which is fine, <laughs> uh, because you've introduced a, 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 an approach, a way of looking at things, and um, and we've uh, I found it very interesting. I'm sure a lot of us have. So thank you very much. Uh, well, thanks to everybody. Yeah, for all of your feedback and everything. Thank you. <laughs>